You go, but I don't have that ability. It's okay, because God's going to loan you the ability to do this. So God is going to just pick any random angel. Now, when we get to heaven, and that angel may come up to me and he goes, dude, I'm no random angel. I'm a special. It's whatever. I'm not offending the angel. I'm just telling you, his name is not important because he is acting on the authority of God. You and I, who we are is not important. If we're acting on the authority of God, his authority supersedes who we are. Okay, so you and you and I don't have to be some big Hollywood, big name and lights person to do something incredible for God because we're doing it under his power and under his authority. So now I want to, this is a picture. I don't know where this is, uh, but it's the bottomless pit. It's 65 feet deep. This person may not understand the concept of bottomless pit. If they think Number one, that you can measure it. Number two, it's 65 feet deep. Okay, there are potholes in Nashville that are 65 feet deep right now. So the bottomless pit, think about what is the bottomless pit? What is, this is actually, the abyss is the bottomless pit. Now, how can you have, and this is my favorite scene, I've been falling for 30 minutes, okay? Again, if you don't know what that means, you're not watching enough Marvel movies. The only way you can be in a bottomless pit is in every, every direction, you can fall in every direction. So it's a sphere. The, you know, you're just falling forever. Now, so this angel, we don't know his name, he's got a key to the abyss, the bottomless pit, and he's got a chain. Now, I was doing some work for uh, um, uh, Bill and I's friend, Rick, and, uh, Rick and Rick and his wife were out of town, and he said, hey, while you're there, if you don't mind, if you just take the dogs outside and put them on the, on the leash so they can run for a little while, okay? And I said, well, you know, what do you do? Just, just pick them up. They're rat dogs, is what he said. Those are his exact words. Just pick them up. They're rat dogs and just carry them outside. Me, like an idiot, I get a dog in this hand, I get a dog in this hand, and now I'm like opening the door, and their dogs are like, we don't know you. Why are you touching us? And, and I get them outside, and I can only find one of the ropes. The other rope, I have no idea where it is. And so, you know, and, and it's like, dummy, how are you going to hook up a dog when you have a dog in both hands? And, you know, I... So I, I lost one of the dogs, okay? He came back, but I only got one. Now, the next day, a little smarter, I took the dogs out one at a time, okay? This guy's got a chain, and he's got the keys to the bottomless pit, and he is coming out. Verse 2, um, verse two and 3. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. Okay, I wonder who he's grabbing. It's the devil, okay? It's Satan. And bound him for a thousand years. Now, this thing called the millennium, it's about a thousand years. There's going to be a thousand years. People say, well, but it's only in the Bible in that one chapter. That's true. But it's in that chapter six times. And when God says a thousand years, is he speaking metaphorically? Is it just, well, it's just going to be a long time? I'm, I'm thinking it's a thousand years. Um, and the early church had no problems believing this was an actual thousand years. So I'm going to go with the early church and say, well, this was a, probably a thousand years. So he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Now we see absolutely no effort from this from this angel. We don't see there was a big right, there was a big fight and, and, and there was a big wrestling match. We see he he has a chain in one hand, a key in the other hand, he walks up, he binds him and he throws him and he closes the door and he locks it. And that's it. When we have the authority of God, we can do some pretty amazing things. And I want to encourage you to always give God the glory and don't go, well, did you see what I just did? Okay, so this is like Steve McGarrett saying to Dano, book him, Dano. The guy's just like, "Uh, uh," you know. So I don't know if this means that, that Satan has been completely stripped of his power or if God's authority in saying, you go do this, is so powerful that he can't, he didn't even, he can't even move. He's like catatonic. Whatever it is, he goes away. And watch what happens. He loses his influence, throws in the abyss, shut and sealed over him, so that he would not deceive the nations 
any longer. How many of you believe there might be a little deception in the news today? There might be a little deception in people today. There might, we, Satan is trying to deceive us. What is he trying to deceive us? Well, he's trying to deceive us anything other than the pure gospel. He's, he'll go on the religious side and go, yeah, it's Jesus, but it's also this and this and a lot of this and a little bit of this and some of that. Okay, that's a deception. Or, man, the Bible is all just a bunch of junk. Here's one of the things that's been really speaking to me. How many of y'all have seen at least one person post or, or make reference to, I'm tired of people saying prayers and thoughts. Prayers and thoughts are just, that you're, you're just, you're just you Christian people are so, you just think prayers and thoughts are gonna help out. Look, if you don't understand what we mean by prayers and thoughts, I can see why you'd be upset by the fact all we're, what we're sending out to you is prayers and thoughts. It's such a cop-out. Like, why don't you actually do something? If you understood what prayers and spiritual thoughts could accomplish, you'd be going, hey, pump up the prayers and thoughts. So we live in a society where they've been told that prayers and thoughts are just, that's just spiritual mumbo-jumbo and it doesn't do any good. So... Little side note there. So, so the, the, he's going to not be able to deceive the nations any longer for a thousand years. Now, Satan not being somewhere for a thousand years. In chapter 19, we just saw everybody who's been taking the mark of the beast and worshipped him, and they're gone. They're bird food. And now Satan, the deceiver, is going to be put away for a thousand years. So whoever's left is going to get the first chance since Adam and Eve to live in a world where Satan is not there to influence and deceive. In the garden, he, he, de he deceived Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were led by that into sin, and now that's gone. Okay? Uh, verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been, headed, uh, been, been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now I believe at this point, what we're talking about is not, is not the church, because remember, I believe the church is already gone. But we've had this seven-year period where people have come to know the Lord during that t tribulation. Many of them have been uh, persecuted unto death, um, and so they're going to be—they're going to be now rejoined, and they're going to—they're going to be able to to reign with Jesus during this thousand years, uh, and and uh, uh, without the influence of Satan, without the deception of Satan. Verse five: The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. What this is talking about is everybody else who's died since Adam and Eve, and they never had a relationship with Jesus. They weren't raptured with the church because they were spiritually, they've been spiritually dead. Now, there are a lot of different the theologies, theories about, okay, it's a holding thing. There's, there's paradise. There's Gehenna. There's, there's all these different things. Whatever it is, these people are going to stay there another thousand years. Wherever it is they've been since they died, they're going to stay another thousand years. They are going to be brought out. But all we have left on earth during this thousand-year reign are those who have not taken the sign of the beast, those who did not worship the beast, those who have given themselves to Jesus. And then it goes on in verse um, 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So the first resurrection... The Christians that have come back, they will not experience the second death. What is the second death? The second death is when God says, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, here's one of the things that, that I know has got to be troubling to Satan. Satan has been in the presence of the glory of God. You and I have been in God's presence in some, in some powerful ways probably. But we've never actually been in the throne room. If any of you have been in the throne room, I'd, be, I'd probably know because you'd be beaming right now. But, but, but Satan used to work there. He knows the, what the glory of God looks like. And eventually he is going to never 
be able to see that ever again. And these people are going to get a glimpse of the glory of God and then be going, okay, do you like what you see? Isn't, isn't, isn't it awesome? Doesn't it make you want to bow and, and worship? Okay, now you're going to be removed from that forever. The second death is when we will be removed from God for eternity. We're not, we're not going to get another chance to come back and take another look. So he, what he's saying there is that, that it's, it's better for us to have experienced the first resurrection so that we will not suffer the second death. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Verse 7 and 8 says this, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. Now, um, first of all, they, a thousand years gets, gets one sentence here, okay? Seven years we've spent, you know, five months on, okay? But, but this thousand year reign, all, all we get is this, is this one thing. And what is this thing about Gog and Magog? Well, if you go back to the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel, there was a guy named Gog. He was the king over Magog. And he had just begun to rattle his, rattle his sword and saber and say, I'm going, to, I'm going to put together my army and all the armies of all my allies, and we are going to come. And, and look, Israel, you don't have gates, you don't have doors, you don't have bars, you have no security. We are going to come in on you like a flood. We're going to run over you like a piece of paper. We're just going to have our way with you. And so God, in Ezekiel chapter 38, God, God is telling his man, he goes, okay, <laughs> would you send, send God a little message for me? And, and you should go and read that, because it's kind of like, like God is just like, okay, and, and then what I'm going to do? Oh, and then, and then, and then, and, and tell him, and then, and here's how it ends up in Ezekiel chapter 38, 22 and 23. Here's what God is saying to Gog and Magog and everybody who's going to go with him. With pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. That's what he said back then to an earthly king who was going to come against his, his chosen people, Israel. So what the, what, the, what the angel has been telling John to write and what John is writing is, okay, what God is saying, okay, you remember Gog and Magog? Okay, it's that times a thousand. So when Satan comes back out, when I release him out for a very short time, and he's had a thousand years of falling to think about, oh yeah, when I get out of this place, I'm going to gather up all my, I'm just, and man, I'm going to really show God, this is the guy who just some random angel came up, lassoed him, and threw him in the bottomless pit. And he has deceived himself. Have you ever noticed people who deceive people are usually pretty much people who are deceived? They, they, they lie to you because they've been lying to themselves. I mean, that's kind of... The, so he's been deceiving himself for a thousand years. When I get out of here, I'm going to really show God. And God's like, you remember Gog and Magog? It's that times eternity. It's that times the spiritual equivalent of the beat down that I put on Gog and Magog is, the, is, is what's going to happen here. So, so that's where he, he, he gives this reference to Gog and Magog to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. All right. Then we go back to uh, chapter 20, verse 9. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. <laughs> so much for your thousand-year plan. Not, not a very sound plan. And unfortunately, uh, you're fighting against the creator of all heavens and earth. Verse 10. 
And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. The devil who deceived them. That's the one, that's 